Building Bridges Amongst the Wretched of the Earth was the theme at this year's 12th Annual Steve Biko Lecture at the Nelson Mandela University. This lecture coincides with what would have been Steve Biko's 76th birthday. The keynote speech was delivered by Dr. Janine Ntiri Ha Geza, who's the founding director at the Center for Genocide and Human Rights Research in Africa. And we leave you with a full address by Dr. Ntihire Geza. From all of us, good night. I would like to, to express um, my deep gratitude for of being, can you all hear me? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, yes, I'd like to express my gratitude for being with you today. It means a lot to me to be present with people who know themselves and maybe those who are trying to know them, to get to know themselves. It's just wonderful. I had a chance to walk in the footprints of Steve Bantu Biko in the last two days and it was all transformative. I invite those of you who are out there who haven't done it, it's powerful do it. It brings change. So, um, it is indeed an honor and privilege to join the illustrious list of those who preceded me in delivering the Stephen Bantu Biko lecture. I was asked to address the topic of Biko leaves um, building the bridges among the wretched of the earth. The wretched of the earth. Franz Fanon's words. Who are we? When I ask myself, who am I? Am I allowed to go all the way to answer the questions without anybody blocking me? Who am I? Am I able to find myself out there? Am I able to find myself here, there, yesterday, tomorrow? Am I? Who am I? Stephen Bantu Biko got us there. Have we picked up from where he left off? Would we say, as the wonderful poet said, would we be proud to say we made it? I don't think so. And today's conversation is about how do we do it? We bridge, we build the bridges. In Kirundi and Kinyarwanda, we say izina nijomontu, which means a person's name impacts who she or he becomes. Well, Bantu. In the, in the languages, in, um, in Ngosa, did I say it right? I tried. Um, the, uh, it means um, and this is really actually um, Kosinati uh, is the one uh, who shared this in one of the interviews that the name means the people's person. In Kirundi and Kinyarwanda it also means people. So Stephen Bantu Biko represented us all. It's not new, we already know it, but we want to work with it. He is, he represents people, Bantu. So I like to say the full name, Steve Bantu Biko, and it's more, even more rhythmic. So those who knew Biko said that uh, the name described him as Nkosinati Biko said, uh, who is of course the CEO, for those who don't know him, um, the CEO of Steve, the Steve Biko Foundation, a, um, and the eldest of because four children. <laughs> Having been uh, uh, able to closely engage in his work and meet his contemporaries and family members, I can say Izina Nijomondu. I've seen people talk about him. I've walked where he walked. I even went to the cell um, where he was, uh, when he was arrested, where he, he stayed, when he was arrested. Um, so telling about Stephen Bantu Biko and telling, telling about the black consciousness movement is telling about the life of people who still need to tell their stories, 
who the story of agency, the story of resilience in oppression context. This is how Stephen Bantuki continues to live among us when we tell our stories, when we share our stories. Let me first share a, a quote from the 1984 Frank Talk editorial in the second volume, and I read, Biko lives. Two words slashed across a ghetto wall, a phrase that haunts the nights of South Africa's rulers. Reactionaries and opportunists of every stripe hope and pray that it will disappear under a rain of blood and the, the whitewash of reform. It, but it remains bold and powerful, not a tired and worn out slogan, but a battle cry of a generation whose hopes and aspirations are for revolution and the end of all exploitation and oppression. End of quote. So how do we end it, uh, all exploitation and oppression? The answer is we build bridges. And this is the end of the lecture. Let's go home. <laughs> As Zambians say, if you want to run fast, run alone. If you want to run far, you run with others. So the answer is, let's join forces. You join, joining force, forces, inspiring each other, provides strength, courage, and resilience to keep, it, to keep at it. When you know that 99% of black people live in poverty in the world, and more than 20 million Africans have been killed in less than 100 years for, uh, to mass violence, producing more than 100 million survivors and numerous uh, refugees in the world. We cannot wait any longer to build bridges. There is a sense of urgency. Let's fight together. The more than 20 million lives lost to genocide and mass atrocities are from just six countries. Just six countries, Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo, Namibia, Rwanda, Sudan, and Uganda. Numbers such as these are difficult to gather, particularly when perpetrators are in, still in power. So that's all I have for now, by hope. If there's a, a graduate student who wants to continue this job, to really figure out what the, how many people are we losing on a regular basis to mass violence, to genocide and mass violence? Um, but we, we, we need to keep going. We need to keep going. So um, these devastations leave behind deep wounds such as trauma, including generational trauma. So it doesn't end with those who, uh, who died and their survivors. Even if, uh, later generations suffer from that trauma. Uh, research has shown again and again that generational trauma is real and until it's dealt with, it cannot heal by itself. So if not uh, intentionally uh, healed, we get crippled. We become crippled individuals. Entire communities are affected. In addition to these wounds, continuous oppression, because it doesn't stop, continuous oppression undermines productivity. They say, well, they are lazy, they don't work. We're hurting, we carry wounds. How can we be productive? How can we pro pro participate in progress? Joining forces requires knowledge of self, knowledge of what happened, and knowledge of those who are going, undergoing the same thing. We need to know so that we can join forces. In order to build strong uh, bridges, one has to know self and also who the wretched of the earth are. Self-awareness promotes healing. If one inherits a garden full of weeds, no matter how healthy the seeds are, 
they cannot grow in such a garden. They will be choked up and die. I don't know if anybody has tried to grow anything in a, a field full of uh, weeds. Nothing comes out of it. So one has to be aware of the, the weeds, remove them, and proceed to fertilization. In other words, one has to be aware of the individual and collective trauma that has crippled generations for centuries. Until then, we have to start, and, and we have, and we have to start sharing our story. We will build the kind of empathy that will engender the willingness to fight together with, with, with the common goal once we start sharing our stories. So I'm going to start with my story. Are you ready? I didn't know I was black until I was 30 years old. Mm -hmm. You heard it, 3-0. I didn't know I was black, seriously. You think, yep, that's the way it was. I was a new graduate student at, in the United States of America. Um, I wanted to buy a, tree, a, a answering machine and uh, they, wouldn't give, they kept giving me a broken one and then when I returned for a third time with a friend, um, I, uh, they gave us, uh, gave us a working one and because he was in front of me, he asked for it and um, they gave it to him and also they were saying, may I help you, may I help you to him. I had gone twice, nobody said, may I help you, may I help you. So I asked him, how come they are asking you to, to, they want to help you, but they didn't, and then they gave me a, a broken machine twice. And he looked at me and said, because he could say, we were friends, so I could say it. He said, Janine, you're black. And I, oh, no, I was a new student in America and uh, I had read all about the suffering, the plight of black people in South Africa, in America, everywhere. But that wasn't relevant to my life in Burundi. There was something very serious, utterly wrong. It wasn't about blackness and whiteness. It was being Hutu or Tutsi. That's what I was carrying. I was running and running because I hadn't been allowed to talk about my Hutuness, to talk about what happened to my father, to my, my brother. No, I was still running and running. Now I'm in America, freedom. Oh no, I'm black, I found out. So had, I had read all of that in books, but being black did not become relevant to my life until that day. Did I awake that day? No, I can't really much go on. There was a dream to chase. But things kept happening. I come back to how I came to realize that I need to wake up and act. So um, then I wondered how many people through time, I wonder how many people who are oppressed, who are out there and don't even realize how oppressed they are. How many out there don't want to face the root cause of their oppression? Because they are scared. They are wounded and they are scared. Many of us, I was one of those. And actually, I'm still, I still I am. I knew I was among the wretched of the earth by being a Hutu in Burundi at that time. This was in 1991, by the way. And so, who are the wretched of the earth? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the wretched of the earth as deeply affect, afflicted, dejected, or depressed, contemptible, inferior. I, if you had seen what I wrote here in capital letters, inferior. The oppressed are not responsible for being wretched. Someone did it to them. 
their realiza- this realization should bring those in these conditions to fight together, to unite in order to achieve true mental and systemic liberation, mental liberation, as Steve Bantubiko would want us to do. All those who suffer longing for justice, freedom, and peace ought to fight in unison. For this to happen, we have to know each other. We have to know the stories of, the, of each other. We have to know what's in the curriculum. Have you checked recently, since the last time you were in elementary school? What's in there? Has anything changed? Paolo Freire defines critical consciousness as the ability to intervene in reality in order to change it. Are we revisiting the curriculum to change it? We need to question everything. We need to write to use the right names. We need to become aware of the condition we are in and being able to do something about it is key. Stephen Bantu, because of consciousness, was not passive, it, it was active and he lost life for it. His achievements in his short 30 years, remember? He was a kid when he was 30 years. I was trying to find my, I didn't even know who I was at 30 years of age. He inspires us all. He certainly has inspired me big time. Okay. So the next two slides are quite disturbing, so bear with me, I'll be quick with them. This is Congo, Democratic Republic Congo under King Leopold II. More than 10 million lives killed earlier on between 1885 and 1908. More than 6 million recent, more recently between 1996 and 2010. If you didn't know about that, you are, you are not alone. Well, that's a big country. Let's take a little country, Burundi. 1972, genocide strikes Tutsis killing Hutu. Don't confuse Rwanda. So in Rwanda, Hutus were a majority and were, um, killed the Tutsis in the genocide, at least majority. Um, and they in majority in these numbers. I'm just going to use majority. Um, and then in Burundi, the Hutus were majority also, but the Tutsis killed the Hutus. So it's the reverse of the Rwanda situation. But the perpetrators, the regime in Burundi, denied it, silenced everyone. We couldn't talk about it. Recently, 19, in, in 2022, 2021, guess what? There you see. So I'll move from it so we don't get um, caught up in these images. I apologize for those of you who it may have um, affected. So. We couldn't talk about it. So you have a giant Democratic Republic of Congo, millions of people dying, in Burundi. And in Burundi, it was the 1972 genocide, it was the first genocide post-independence, okay? But nobody, I mean, if you've never heard of it, you're not the only one, I can assure you, because the government managed to silence inside and outside. I'll come back to that later. But the fact that, Nothing happened to that general, nobody, there's impunity, not, it wasn't talked about, guess what happened? Cycle of violence. If you don't deal with it, it happens again and again. So year after year, five years, 10 years, and until recently, genocide, mass atrocities kept happening. Now, did we mourn, did we, um, um, uh, were we allowed public mourning? No, that wasn't even an option. Okay, I'll move on. Okay. So, it was, there was no mourning. Then in 2019, I traveled to Burundi um, to visit. The same summer, I went to Cambodia. 
So in Burundi, 2019, there was a, remember, so we lost about 200,000, more than, I'm sorry, more than 3,000 people were killed and they were only Hutu elite men in Burundi. Guess what? In 2019, there was nothing, no memorialization. You don't talk about it. People are still whispering. I traveled the same summer to Cambodia and I found they not only memorized, that they remember their loved ones, that they lost. The survivors made sure that there is detail about that genocide. They marked it in the bones. This one was died. There was a, um, um, a hammer. This one died. Uh, they used the hammer. They used, so they have detail about how these people died. That's how much they valued memorization because they were allowed to. They could. In Burundi, it was zero. There was nothing you couldn't tell at that time. But then, of course, you just saw the slide before how they end up, um, they went through cycles of violence because they didn't recognize the evil. Okay, so now, oh, all right, there you go. So I'm going to pause on this slide. So this looks almost like a silly slide, okay? But colonization not only took material goods, but it infiltrated the minds through formal education, the ways we dress, the way we sing. We, we heard our, our poet, how she represented that. And the languages we adopted, the names we adopted, the, and the example here of tarot roots. Tarot roots actually is a, uh, the, the translation, I don't know if it does justice, but in Kirundi and Kinyawanda we call them amateke. Okay? And the amateke are just Burundian Rwandan uh, roots that we eat on a regular basis, right? But to name them, to show which one is better quality than the other, one is amateke yikirundi. And amateke yiki zungu. So some of you know muzungu, white, right? The word for white in Swahili and in Kirundi. So amateke yiki zungu, oh, the words shifted. I, I'm, I'm, I apologize. Uh, it's supposed to be, let's see if I can. Uh, okay, so the left, uh, go back. Okay, all right. Okay, so the ones actually on the right, on the left are the uh, Matekiki Zung, and the ones on the right are the uh, Matekiki Rund. So because of quality, so it's a beautiful, it's a Wiki Zung, um, 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 white, and then Kirundi. So just, this looks like a simple, small example, but that's how deep colonization has got to us. Um, and... Uh, so how do we get rid of, how do we take out um, that, such influence? But, so this is an indicative of how badly colonized uh, our African knowledge system is. Um, we know that if even a black person becomes rich and looks good, they say you've become muzungu, you've become white. Um, so we cannot, we cannot liberate our minds what Steve Biko, Bantu Biko asks of us until we remove weeds from the garden. A formal education, especially through boarding schools, let me check the time, um, tore the Ubuntu humanity fabric. While people physically, uh, while, while white uh, people physically left, or in this case in South Africa stayed, their cultures remained with us, ingrained in everything we do, everything we say, everything we think about, it's all there. The demeaning language is still there. We haven't managed to clean it up. And most importantly, they left us with the deep wounds. They left the Ubuntu tone. How are we going to mend it? It's the only way we can bring our hands together to build bridges. It continued to be torn as new leaders continued to implement the divide and rule policy of the colonizers. The population got doubly wounded first from colonization and then from ethnic strife that led to genocide 
in countries like Rwanda and Burundi. So many of you have heard of Hutus and Tutsis, and sometimes they are difficult to, talk, to pronounce. And in the Great Lakes of Africa, Burundi, Rwanda, Democratic Republic, and with influence, refugees are now all over, including uh, South Africa. And the ones on the right are the Mat uh, Matagiki Rundi. So because of quality, so it's a beautiful, it's a Vikizungu, um, 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 white, and then a Kirundi. So just, this looks like a simple, small example, but that's how deep colonization has got to us. Um, and uh, so how do we get rid of, how do we take out um, that such influence? But, so this is an in indicative of how bad we colonize, uh, colonize our African knowledge system is. Um, we know that if even a black person becomes rich and looks good, they say you've become Muzungu, you've become white. Um, so we cannot, we cannot liberate our minds what Steve Biko, Bantu Biko asks us of us until we remove weeds from the garden. A formal education, especially through boarding schools, let me check the time, um, tore the Ubuntu humanity fabric. While people physically, uh, while, while white um, people physically left, or in this case in South Africa stayed, their cultures remained with us, ingrained in everything we do, everything we say, everything we think about, it's all there. The demeaning language is still there. We haven't managed to clean it up. And most importantly, they left us with the deep wounds. They left the Ubuntu torn. How are we going to mend it? It's the only way we can bring our hands together to build bridges. It continued to be torn as new leaders continued to implement the divide and rule policy of the colonizers. The population got doubly wounded first from colonization and then from ethnic strife that led to genocide in countries like Rwanda and Burundi. So many of you have heard of Hutus and Tutsis and sometimes they are difficult to, talk, to pronounce. And in the Great Lakes of Africa, Burundi, Rwanda, Democratic Republic, and with influence, refugees are now all over, including uh, South Africa, who fled running from um, the, the, the genocide, and genocides really, because there were many um, through time. So why in the 70s, while Steve Bantubiko and his contemporaries were fighting for freedom in South Africa, leading to the creation of the Black Consciousness Movement, subhuman characteristics were imprinted on the Hutu minds in Burundi. So now I'm coming back to that to the genocide, 1972 genocide in Burundi by the Tutsi regime. Segregation was implemented in various systems, education, judiciary, army, and many other areas in the country. Hutus didn't have access to the prestigious positions. I didn't know I was Hutu until I was 13 years old. So I didn't know I was black until I was 30, three zero, and I didn't know I was Hutu until I was 13 years old. And you may wonder, what did I think I was? Well, Hutu Tutsi is not like being Zulu or Osa uh, or, or um, Swazi, no, it's, it was imposed. These two terms, yes, they are Burundi and they are Kirundi. They are part of their words in the Kirundi, but they were picked up as what they could use what the colonizers, Belgians, uh, 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 Germans, they picked up those words because, and used them to divide us. So if you had a straight nose, they would measure the nose and kind of narrow, you are Tutsi. If you have a flat nose, you are Hutu. Done. Go on, keep on, keep going. So people call these ethnic groups 
these were imposed words, categories that we did not buy into. That's why I didn't know I was Hutu. If you had asked, uh, if you ask a Burundian when they got to know, actually, it, I've been uh, running uh, interviews, uh, collecting stories, genocide stories, uh, testimonies, and I, one of the questions is, when did you get to know you were Hutu or you were Tutsi? And they all pointed to around 1972. That tells you that this was all socially a social construct to divide and rule. Um, so the uh, the um, let me go back to my text. Otherwise, I'm going to run out of time. Um, so my two th so at that time. So how did I get to know? Because a, a, a classmate revealed to me um, that I was Hutu and that my father was killed because he was Hutu. I had no idea. I thought. He actually, they had told me he had fled, he was in Tanzania. So I was still waiting for him uh, two years in, um, but I had no idea he had been killed because he was Hutu. And also I learned that my mother was Tutsi. I was in a boarding school in the seventh grade, waiting to go home to ask her why in the world she didn't choose to be Tutsi, Hutu like us, like my father and me. So from that time on, I was told that I didn't have to write to the air. So little girls and boys Tutsi would come and say, stop breathing. And because we had large noses, and they would finish all the air. So they didn't want us to stop. <laughs> Yeah, so it is still bugs my mind that the first genocide in post-independence Africa was so successfully denied and silenced. Fifty years later, more than four mass graves, as you saw in one of the slides, 4,000 mass graves have found in this tiny little country in Burundi. Uh, and who is managing this state of affairs? This, these are the orphans of 1972 who are dealing with the bones of their lost ones. And every time, of course, we see a bunch of bones, we say, could that be my, is my father there, my brother there? My, so we're constantly looking at those bones, not knowing what to do. Uh, do we, have, we don't have the technology to find out who those bones belong to, which family has their those maybe they are in the in Lake Tanganyika also so we have we never know and so the collection of testimonies says it all men and women in their 60s 70s 80s break down crying for the first time because they are sharing they are allowed to share their stories publicly um, so those were children you know they were orphans they were uh, children in 1972 and now they are allowed to pub publicly mourn their loved ones for the first time so it's quite powerful when I'm, I'm listening to these stories um, when I collect them and so now we can only build bridges because once the silence uh, we, we have to know who we are uh, because once the silence was imposed by the Tutsi uh, dominated government, um, the, Burundians, the Burian, Burundian authority did not, combined with our culture in Burundi, in Kirundi especially, uh, the, we are not allowed to talk about the dead. Uh, it, it, we, if you say you talk about someone, or if you're referring to where someone used to live, you say where. Um, the the Nyakwigira, the person who left. So depending on the context, so you can't say their names because you're stopping them from resting. So the authority used the culture to really silence everyone everywhere. Okay, so we can only build strong bridges if we aim to heal together uh, through relationships and meaningful uh, connections. Um, so we can only uh, build bridges if we realize, recognize, and respond, and resist to re-traumatization. And not just in silos, but together. Again, by listening to each other's stories. We can build bridges by creating conditions that create safety, a sense of safety that reduces uncertainty and create predictable structures. 
we can build bridges and succeed if we memorialize what happened to the oppressed for healing's sake and to promote critical conscientization. Often times, the oppressed tend to inherit memorialization of the oppressor's events with no room for memorialization of what happened to them. The lost lives are not memorialized. We tend to inherit those structures, those monuments, those spaces created by the oppressor without space for our, our own. And more importantly, without space for our own knowledge, African knowledge, that's absolutely amazing. In such situations, survivors can never heal fully. So remembering in order to heal, part of the consciousness is to become aware of what happened to us, the pain that, caused, uh, that was caused on us. Black pride, promoted by Steve Bantubiko, a great example of memorialization, is there for us to use. The challenge is to find ways to harness memory, to learn the lessons from the past in, effort, in an effort to avoid repeating it. Without a proper engagement with the past and with institutionalization of remembrance, societies are condemned to repeat it, to repeat, reenact, and relieve the, the horrors. Forgetting is not a good strategy for societies transiting, transiting into a minimally decent condition. And this was uh, presented by Bagarava, um, one of the authors who work a lot on memorialization. Promoting interconnectedness can build bridges to lead to strong unity. I witnessed the building bridges, what building bridges look like when I participated in Steve Bantu because annual memorial activities um, where President Nevis Kekema, who is here with us today, uh, the president of Azania People's uh, Organization, Azako, and um, President um, Mwanele Nyoto uh, of Pan-African uh, Congress, how they brought together their organizations to celebrate this special event. The outcome was a rich sharing of thoughts, of ideas, and lots of singing and dancing. And I can only imagine the day after, the days after, the months, the years after, if they keep working together, what could happen? An example of building bridges around social movements to connect with those on the surface may appear to have little in common with those who may have, uh, look like they don't have much in common, but we all know, in, as in Kirundi, those who speak Kirundi, uh, and I think those also who speak the Nguni languages may hear, which means the personhood of a person is made whole by the existence of another person. In other words, alone we are inevitably incomplete. We are broken even, and when we break, nobody is there to pick us up alone. But if we are doing it together, Ubuntu no wondi. We make each other whole. Ubuntu is a part of African heritage. It is not perfect, we know that. We can, we can keep building it, but we have to mend it so that we can use it as a tool that can not just be shared among us, among Africans, but put in the world. We've been, we are importing democracy, which is not her inherited. We inherited a tool, an incredible tool, Ubuntu, a way of life. But we ha so we have to keep working on it. We have, it, is, it is almost universally acknowledged that in order to get the right answers, you have to ask the right questions. So if we ask how we're going to use Ubuntu, we start small. We start one by one, and we build it, and we build it. We start in education, in the curriculum. And I keep repeating curriculum because I'm also in the business of education. 
what we put in there is so important. It influences our students, our youth, the future leaders of our countries. So it's important that we train them to ask questions. We ask, we don't ask, we, we, what can be done? We ask what can be done rather than what's wrong. So umutkwen hui giri nam is another proverb in Kiruni that where we say one head cannot advise itself. Umutkwe hui giri nam. So end of course this way, we, uh, the Lord is lighter when we are connected, when we are working together. So there's a lot that's been published about Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a home here. Uh, there's so much work that's been done already. There are centers that build around Ubuntu. So, but Africa, this way of life, favor, which favors communalism above individualism, which is a code of trust so that suffering of one is conceived as the suffering of all will get us there, will help us build those bridges. And it is because it strives for harmony and security offered by the group and self-sacrifice by individuals for the larger group. So I'm going to end with a, a quote. Oh, I had this slide to show. This is my mother who modeled how you build bridges. And I'll, I'll take time, let's see, do I have time? Yeah, let me share this story. So, um, my mother Tutsi, I'm a Hutu because my father was Hutu, so she was married to a Hutu. When she when was growing up as kids, among neighbors, people didn't like to hear, to, to share a meal with Batwa people. It's a horrible, yes I know. But that's the way it was. So we were Hutu, Tutsi, Twa. The Batwa people are like 1% of the population, but they were just like the minority of minorities in every sense of it. And so they didn't have access to much. So when they came to sell pots, that they, the clay pots that they, uh, they made themselves, we would feed them. They would usually have their own plate and leave, we eat in a corner. That's what I observed in the, in the neighborhood. But my mother would say, uh-uh. So we would sit down and she'd give this platter full of food and we'd sit down to eat. And when the, uh, the Mutua person would come, we'd start going like, uh, like almost being uncomfortable and our mother would just give us that look, you know. I don't know if you remember that look. And we know to not to just eat with this one. And she'd say, Abatwa Nabantu. Twa people are also humans. So she taught us to eat with them. There's no, um, of, um, and putting down other people. So also she shared with us, so when we had this concept, I don't have time to go deep into it, a uh, Hutu, there was this word Hutu of course existed, and if, some, if I gave you a cow, and you will become my Hutu. And so you'll be giving me some gestures to say thank you every so often, because I gave you a cow, a cow gives milk, it gives manure, and all of that. So my mother, we had a Hutu, even if my father was a Hutu, but he had a Hutu. So when he um, died, my mother told this family to stop bringing the food. Said, go take care of your family. It was a system of Gushikana. Go take care of your family. That's really, so those two examples showed how she uh, modeled what it is like to work for social justice. Um, so I will end with this quote. Um, first I read a short poem and then I'll end with this quote. Um, there is no greater power than a community discovering what it cares about. Ask what's possible and not what's wrong. Keep asking. Notice what um, you care about. Notice uh, what you care about. Now I got my pages mixed up. Okay. So, um, you know what? Yeah, I put them down and, all right, that's okay. So, I assume, assume that many others share your dreams. Be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. Talk to people who you never talk to. Build those bridges. And my last quote is one, um, where Obama, Mr. Uh, President Obama, former President Obama, on his meeting with Pope Francis, he said, I think the theme of, uh, that stitched our 
conversation together was a belief that in politics and in life, the quality of empathy, the ability to stand in somebody's else's, to somebody else's shoes and to care for someone, even if they don't look like you and, or talk like you and, or share your philosophy, that's critical. And that's what we should be doing to, to um, be together. So I will stop here because I ran out of time. <laughs>